All right, so we're in Mark chapter number one. And what are we preaching about this morning? The title of my sermon is The Healing Power of Jesus. And this is something that you, re you read the Gospels, you're reading a lot about the works of Jesus Christ and a lot about Him healing people and changing people's lives. And this is something that it almost seems to go, you, you read it so much, it's almost like it's unnoticed. You know, I mean, it's, well, of course Jesus healed people. And when we go out and preach the gospel, you know, we, we tell people, you know, a little bit about Jesus Christ, just, you know, making sure they know who Jesus is. We explain that He's the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. We explain these various things. And I usually tell people, you know, He performed a lot of miracles. He's the Son of God. He was proving He was who He said He was. But I got, when I was just doing my Bible reading, kind of preparing this week, and I, I was actually listening, because I do a lot of driving, so I get a lot of Bible listening more than reading even. But I was just kind of marveling in my own mind, especially in the book of Mark. The book of Mark just starts off with Jesus pretty much just doing work. Right? You got the book of Matthew, you got the book of Luke that go into his birth. They talk about a little more of a child, they talk about other things. But Mark is just like, Jesus is just off and just starting doing a whole bunch of work. There's a lot of the works of Jesus Christ are found in the book of Mark. A lot of his healing. Now, the reason why I'm making a point of this, just to start off with, is that Jesus Christ is not, and we know this, but Jesus Christ is not your, your average prophet or your false prophet, right? There's, you've got Muhammad, you've got the, these various you know, religious people, Buddha, whatever, people who have lived throughout history where religions have been formed basically around those individuals. Jesus is so far and above, you know, the impact that he had and, and, and the following is so far and above any of these other false prophets. And one of the main reasons is because of what he did to prove his ministry. There is way more proof of what Jesus Christ did. I mean, he literally was turning the world upside down when he came to this earth. And it was very, very short ministry as well. It wasn't an entire lifetime I mean, his life was cut really short. You know, I mean, it wasn't just decades of, of Jesus Christ preaching and building this great ministry. It was literally approximately, it was approximately three, three and a half years of him actively going out, getting disciples, doing the work. And what's amazing about that, what's amazing is that in that short period of time, I'm going to read for you the last verse of the book of John. One of the most profound statements. I love what it says here. I'm going to read the last two verses. The Bible reads in the last book of John, John 21, 24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that, this, that his testimony is true. This is Apostle John who was literally with Jesus Christ during his ministry. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. That is an extremely profound statement. I mean, think about that. The number of works, the number of lives that Jesus met. If he was going to tell all of the stories of, of the work that Jesus Christ did and everything that he was involved with, he says, I don't even think that the entire world can contain the books that would be written about what Jesus did. Amen. This is why, I mean, this is the proof. This is one of the main proofs we have of Jesus Christ being the Messiah, being the true God, being the true religion is, is, is the impact that he had and the proof of his ministry that he had. We read over and over and we see all these examples and what John is saying and we're, we're going to read a lot of these through the book of Mark. And just keep that in mind that of all of these accounts that we read, that we're barely scratching the surface of, of the impact that Jesus Christ had in people's lives and the amount of work that he literally did. We see Jesus tires, tirelessly going out, you know, getting up early, praying, you know, healing people. We're going to see many accounts of the entire city, you know, cities just coming out and bringing all of their sick out to him so he could heal all these people. And, and the, the vast amount of work that he did, it's incredible. And that's, he was able to reach so many people in such a short period of time. And this is a major proof of, you know, 2,000 years later, you know, we're in 2017, Anno Domini, you know, the year of our Lord, based, I mean, the entire calendar is based off, or our year structure is based off of one man, off of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, that's a pretty significant impact. Amen. Now, we know there's a lot of apostate churches and things out there, but, but, I mean, overall, Jesus Christ 
he made, he made that impact for a reason, because he was who he said he was and because he, these things really happened. I mean, if it was just a fraud, if he was just a charlatan, you know, a lot of people want to just blow these, these evidences, these truth off as if, oh, yeah, he was just like a magician. He was just like this sleight of hand. It's nonsense. It's nonsense to buy into an argument like that. What, you cannot fake the, the vast majority of the things that we see the accounts of Jesus Christ doing in here. Yeah. You can't fake bringing somebody back from the dead. I'm sorry. When all the people, they, when he wasn't even around. The guy died, he wasn't around. You have all these other witnesses around and then Jesus Christ shows up four days later and they're worried about him stinking because it's been so long since he died. And people who weren't even believers in Jesus, people who actually hated Jesus were there present at that time and witnessed what happened. The witness was true. And we see the account they were trying to prevent that witness from coming out. But you can't stop it. It's too great of an event. When people who are lame from their mother's womb, blind from their mother's womb, and, and just all these various diseases and things that are incurable, and Jesus Christ is healing every single one of them, you can't stop that from getting out. You can't stop that from being recorded. You can't stop the, the message the being spread and, and the, literally the vast amount of people ultimately that ended up believing on Christ as a result. I mean, this was his, his ministry came forth not just with the Word of God. Now, if he had just the Word of God, it still would have been true. But God decided, you know what? I'm going to make sure there is not a shadow of a doubt here. The same way that, he, that when he used Moses. There is no shadow of doubt who the true God is. When he's bringing all the plagues down upon Egypt, when he's parting the Red Sea, when they're all going across on dry land, all of the works that he did. Look, this is, this is beyond you know, refute. Amen. It's irrefutable. Jesus Christ was even more so. You, know, you read back on all the things that happened during Moses' time. Jesus Christ did way, way, way more to just give all. The, if you are someone that requires evidence, Jesus Christ, here you go. He's healing. He's doing, you know, there, there's nothing else more. And that's why, you know, when, when the people said, and this is kind of a side note, it's not even in my notes, but You've heard about the, the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost being the only unforgivable sin. You know, the Bible says, you know, he that blasphemy at the Holy Ghost shall have, shall have never, hath never forgiveness. I believe it's in Mark chapter 3, actually. But um, that was in regards to Jesus Christ. Well, then, there it is. Yeah, in verse 23. Well, they accused him. Because Jesus Christ, was not, not only was he healing people, but he was casting out devils. Too. People were possessed with devils. And he was, he was casting them out. And... One of the people there was said in verse 22, it says, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils cast the out devils. So they're seeing him doing great works. They're seeing him casting out devils. They're seeing him healing people. And they're saying, oh yeah, the only reason he's able to do that is because he's of the devil himself. That's extremely wicked. Now, you, you have to put yourself in that situation. You're in a time frame, you're in an era, you're in an area, you're in Israel where they are expecting a Messiah. They know the Old Testament uh, prophesies of the Messiah to come. They know that he's going to come. They know all these, de these various details about him. They don't know everything, but they know a lot about him. Someone shows up on the scene preaching the word of God healing just a vast number of people and they're calling him of the devil. We don't have the opportunities, the same opportunities that they did back then because Jesus isn't physically walking around on this earth today doing all these things that we'd even be able to see with our eyes. Right? Now, ultimately, you still have to believe. But when you have so much going for you, you're hearing the words directly out of Jesus Christ's mouth. I mean, you reject that. that I mean, what else, what more can be done for a person? Right? right? If I'm going to go out and preach the gospel to someone, maybe I don't do a very good job, right? Maybe someone else is just, you know, they, 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 they lack, they're, they're faltering, you know, they have some, some of their own uh, uh, problems and, and, and they don't know the Bible very well, whatever. You know, there's all these different things that could be a factor. But when Jesus Christ himself is there, I mean, you can't get any better than that, okay? He's, he's the perfect example. He's not going to, he, you know, if you can't see what he's doing and hear what he's saying, then... Um, there's nothing more that can be done. And what, what, what's happening here is these people are saying, Satan 
is, is the reason why Jesus is able to cast out devils. And for this reason, it says, um, Jesus goes on to explain, he says in verse 28, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And it, and it goes on to explain, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. That's why he said those things. That's why he said, like, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Because he was doing all the healing and all the works and everything through the power of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, you know what? You blaspheme the Holy Ghost. He says, that person has never forgiveness. You're saying that the Holy Ghost is of the devil? I mean, you're, see, you're seeing all the evidence. You're seeing the power of the Holy Ghost, and you're, you're attributing that to Satan. That's, um, that's why I believe that, the, that this I mean, it's pretty clear that this is talking about that. But anyhow... Jesus Christ performed all of these various things to the point to where he's saying, you know what, if you can't receive this after, after all I've done, you don't, you don't, you, there's, never, there's no more forgiveness offered. This is where people become reprobate. But um, I digress. I don't want to get too far off into the rabbit trail. Go back to Mark chapter 1. Because what I want to point out here and what, what we're going to look at there's three aspects that I want to I point out about these stories of Jesus Christ healing people. And these are all, all these stories are representative of ultimately the healing power that you receive through salvation. But I, I want to point out three distinct um, things about, about the way that Jesus healed. And the first one I want to point out is that it's immediate. This wasn't a slow healing. It didn't take a process. It didn't take a week. It didn't take even hours. Um, you're in Mark chapter 1. Look at verse number 30. Bible records, But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. We're going to see that word immediately quite a bit during the healing of Jesus Christ. Jump down to verse number 40. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. Flip over to chapter 2. Look at verse number 9. We're going to go through these pretty quickly through the book of Mark. Uh, verse number 9, chapter 2. Whether is it easier to say the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know. You see, again, more proof of Jesus' ministry saying, you know what? Because he had already said, thy sins be forgiven thee. When they, when they lifted down, they broke up the roof, they lifted down this man that was sick of the palsy, he saw their faith and he said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And the, and the people that were standing around, some of the Pharisees were like, who does this guy think he is? Only God could forgive sins. So he's making another proof. He's saying, okay, you want, the, you want proof of, of who I am? You want proof that I actually can forgive sins? He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed and went forth before them all. Insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Now, we have so many accounts of this. So many accounts of this. If this was all just a fraud, don't you think it would, it would be a little bit more widely known that this was a fraud during that time? Now, we know that there are people, I mean, the Jews claim that, that it was a fraud. There is that claim still out there, and we know that that claim was made, and it, st it still exists today. But if it truly, I mean, if it truly was just a charlatan, with, with, look at the details of these events. There is no way that you would be able to fake all of this stuff that happened. It's, it's impossible. I mean, I, there's, there's so much evidence there. You say, you know, look, you have to take it on faith. You say, well, I wasn't there. I know you weren't there. But it still needs to be, you know, it needs to be taken on faith. But there's, there are, it's a reasonable faith. It's not just totally blind and just unreasonable. There have been plenty of witnesses to these events. And that when we go preach the gospel, we're witnessing our event with Jesus Christ, our salvation, we're witnessing who Jesus Christ is to other people. Jump over to chapter 5. We're going to look at another, another event here. But notice, immediately the fever left him. Immediately the leprosy departed from him. Immediately he arose and took up his bed. Look, that guy had palsy. There was no cure for that. A leper, there was no cure for leprosy. 
And the other fear, we started off with just a fever. You say, okay, well, that was just a fever. Maybe that was a coincidence, right? No, it wasn't, but <laughs> we're, get, we're getting a little bit more severe here. You go, you go from the fever to leprosy to someone who had palsy. Uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 25, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, but I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, that means immediately, straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Immediately. She hears about Jesus, she goes to Jesus, and she's healed. She's been to the world. She's been to the smartest doctor. She spent all of her money trying to get her issue fixed. Nobody could figure out. Nobody can do it. Jesus didn't even have to do anything. All she did was, was, was have faith, reach out, touch his, his garment, and she was healed. Amazing account. Uh, jump down to verse 41 there in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 41, And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha cumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Now, just to give you a little backstory, because I don't have the whole thing in my notes. This was in the same story where this, this woman who had the issue of blood came to him. Jesus, when, when that happened with, that, with the woman with the issue of blood, he was on his way to this man's house where his daughter was sick and about to die. And as he's still on his way there, they approach him and say, you know what, don't bother Jesus because she's already dead. She's already passed on. So Jesus shows up and he says, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And they, they, the Bible says they laughed him to scorn. They're like, yeah, right, she's dead. We know what a dead person looks like. She's not just sleeping. So Jesus goes in, he sends everyone out and he goes in unto her and he says, and he says, Talitha cumai, which says here in verse 41, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Verse number 42, look at this. And straightway the damsel arose and walked for she was of the age of 12 years and they were astonished with a great astonishment. He brought this girl back from the dead, 12 year old girl, brought her back to life. Turn if you would to Mark chapter seven. There are witnesses to all these things. These, I mean, that's why it's recorded. That's why it's in the Bible, because all these things have been witnessed. Mark chapter 7, verse number 32. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears. And he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. Again, the, the words that are being used, it's, there, there is no doubt here. Immediately, 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 straightway, straightway. Mark 10, verse number 51. You can turn it if you like. Mark 10, verse number 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. There is no lag time here. When Jesus heals someone, it happens immediately. It happens right away. Every single time we see an account of Jesus healing someone, it happens. I mean, there was another man that had sent unto Jesus and he said, Look, don't even come to my house. You just speak the word and my, and my servant will be healed. And he did it. And he, he didn't even have to go and touch him. He says, I know that you have the power to do this. You just say the word and he'll be healed. And he was. And it happened right away. Uh, flip back, if you would, to Mark chapter 6. So that's the first point I just wanted, you wanted to, to mention and just to call to your attention is during all these healings, you're going to notice that it's happening immediately. The second thing I want you to notice is that in the vast majority of these, there's a reference to their faith being the reason why they're made whole. The faith is was the reason. It's not, it's not anything, it's not anything that they did, and it's not even as you're saying, it, it's um, obviously Jesus is performing a miracle, but he's saying it's your faith. It's a result of your faith. That last uh, passage there, Mark 10, um, they said, Go thy way, thy, thy faith hath made thee whole. You're in Mark chapter 6, look at verse number 1. 
Bible reads, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. So we see Jesus Christ is preaching in his own community, where he grew up, where people know him. They say, oh yeah, that's Jesus, because they saw Jesus playing as a kid. They saw Jesus as he was growing up, and just because you know, they're, they're putting too much emphasis on, oh, I know that person. And they don't want to listen to him now as a teacher. Especially, I mean, this, this, is, a, and this is a big thing, and, and this, is, this is a true statement. I know this firsthand. I'm not saying I'm like Jesus in any way, but like, uh, or maybe maybe some tiny, tiny, tiny way, but I'm trying. But um, when this happened to Jesus Christ, you know, it's, it, when you know people, you've been around people, it's a hard time for them to accept you, but they still should. I mean, Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter who you are. You need to accept, hey, this is a prophet. And he, and he, and he makes that statement, but what I want to focus on even more here is that in verse 5, it says, And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Now, th this is another amazing statement because it says that he wasn't able to do any mighty work there. Yeah, he just, he just put his hands and, and healed a few sick folk. Well, if we had that going on today, that's a huge deal, right? I mean, laying his hands on people and just healing a few sick folk, praise God, right? That's a great thing. That's a big event. But in the, in the grand scheme of things and in the work that Jesus Christ was doing, that was nothing. He said there was no great work done there. And then he explains in verse number six, and he marveled because of their unbelief and he went round about the village's teaching. See, the reason why there was no great work there is because of their unbelief. He would have done so much more. But because they said, oh, this is just Jesus. Oh, where does he get this wisdom from? We know him. He was just a carpenter. He just worked with his dad. You know, he's not, he's not a rabbi. He's not, you know, he hasn't been gotten, received all the education. So why should we listen to this guy? Uh, maybe because he's the son of God. Maybe because you've heard of all the works that he's been doing. And even in your own town, he did heal a few sick folk. But you are just too hard-hearted to accept that this Jesus could be the Christ. And he wasn't able to do that much work. But we see here an example that it was their unbelief that prevented him from being able to do these great, the great healings that had been done in many other areas. Uh, you don't have to turn. I'm just going to read through some of these for you. We already saw some of these stories already. Uh, Matthew 9.22, but Jesus turned him about. And when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that, that hour. It's the same account of the woman who had the issue of blood. He said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Mark 10, 52, And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So there's someone who was blind and healed. He says, he's, he's attributing it to their faith. Look, your faith hath made you whole. Your faith hath saved thee. Uh, Luke 18, 41, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. In the book of Acts, turn if you would to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Act 14, verse 8 reads, and this is not Jesus Christ himself healing, but we're going to see the same principle of, of you know, people having faith that is giving, providing the healing for them. Uh, Acts 14, verse 8 says, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, Perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. And again, see, this is through the power of the Holy Ghost. The Apostle Paul was, was healing people through the power of the Holy Ghost, just like Jesus Christ was here, uh, you know, in all the stories that we're looking at. And again, what a great miracle. Someone who was impotent, I mean, he, was, he was lame, he wasn't able, he was crippled, wasn't able to walk from his mother's womb. Now, if someone's not able to walk from their mother's womb and, they come, and they're grown up and they're a grown man, their muscles are not going to be ready. Even if you could heal the, the problem that makes them crippled, 
They're not going to be able to walk because their muscles haven't been used at all. But just to emphasize and to prove this miracle, Paul says, stand up on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. That was a full healing. Right. There is no doubt about that. There is no shadow. Look, that's healing. The doctors would have to go in and try to fix the, the reason for his cripple, you know, fix some bones, put some joints together, you know, maybe even attach some muscles. But when you've gone that long, the muscles are going to be deteriorated. This is full, complete healing, bringing them back to, to, to pure health, to, to completely done. No, no stone left unturned there. You're in Mark chapter 9, look at verse number 23. And, it's, and when Paul looked at him, he said he perceived that he had faith to be healed. Mark 9, 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So that was the, the, the story of Jesus Christ casting out devil from a child. And um, again, Jesus is saying, Look, if you could believe, all things are possible. And this is the good news this morning. Now, we don't have Jesus Christ literally walking around on the street today as he did in these events. But we do have the Holy Ghost. We do have Jesus Christ still exists. He's in heaven and he still is all powerful. And um, we saw even after that, that's why I read that story in Acts 14. Jesus Christ wasn't literally walking around on the earth in those days. But Paul still had the power. The, the Holy Ghost still had the power to heal that person. This healing power is still available today. The last point I want to make is that besides it being immediate, being complete, and, um, and, and we see the element of requiring faith, is that all that came to Jesus were healed. In all these stories, all these accounts, you read the four Gospels, there is not one story of someone coming to Jesus for healing and him not doing it. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 15. This is the closest thing that you'll find to that. Everybody who comes to Jesus gets healed. Even the woman of Canaan. Because remember, Jesus Christ was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus Christ didn't go out and preach the gospel to all the Gentile nations. He stayed within Israel. That's who he was sent for. That's what, he, that's what his, his mission was and he was called to do. But that doesn't mean that salvation isn't for everyone. Matthew 15, 22, this is the, the, probably the closest thing that you're going to see to someone not getting healed that came to Jesus. And we'll see what happens here. Matthew 15, verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then, she, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Amen. The healing still was there. He didn't reject her or refuse her. Why? Because of her faith. Because she had faith. Jesus provided the healing. She came to him. She had the faith. And the healing was, was given. Um, you don't have to turn. I'll read these passages for you. Mark 1, says, And all the city was gathered together at the door. I mean, everyone in the city came to Jesus Christ. And it says, And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Mark 6, 55 says, And ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country... <laughs> <laughs> they laid the sick in the streets and besought him 
that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. There is not one person that made it to Jesus that did not receive healing. All of these things tie in together. Turn, if you would, to Luke 17. We're almost done. Luke 17. All of these things tie in together, and they show us a greater picture. They show us the great picture of our salvation. We're all sinners. We're all you know, sick, if you will, and need healing because we've all broken God's law. We're all guilty of that sin. Jesus Christ provides the healing. When you come to him and you put your faith on him, he gives you healing, and you know what? It happens immediately. It doesn't happen over a period of time. It's not something, well, okay, now you put your faith in Christ, but now you have to do all this other stuff, and then maybe one day you'll actually be saved. No, it happens right away. The healing happens in a moment. It happens immediately. And you know what? It happens completely. Amen. There is nothing left undone. When you have a problem, when you have that sickness, when we have the sickness of sin, you know what? It's healed completely. Just as the, as the man who was sick of the, you know, the lame on his feet, the men that didn't have the, their sight, it's healed 100% through and through. And anybody that comes to him in faith will receive that healing. You're in Luke chapter 17. I want to point this out because we received some criticism. You say, that's all great, Pastor Burns, and, and I believe that. I believe in the, in the healing power of Jesus, and I, and I can see how that's uh, symbolic of, of our salvation. And you have a church here that goes out and wins souls, and, and what a lot of the naysayers will say is that, well, you're supposedly you're bringing the healing of Jesus Christ to people, right? Yeah, we are. Amen. It's exactly what we're doing. Well, then, if, the, if all these people are getting saved, you say you got 100 people saved last year through your soul winning efforts, then, then why, why isn't your church bigger? Where are all these people that are getting healed, right? Look at Luke chapter 17, verse number 12. We're going to see a, a perfect example of this. Luke 17, verse number 12. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So we see ten lepers coming to Jesus and calling on his name. Right? All ten of them saying, Lord, have mercy on us. Verse 13, or verse 14, And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Jesus saying, Didn't I heal ten of you? Why is there only one to come back and to give thanks and to give glory unto God? Why is there only one? Now, that's sad that there's only one, isn't it? But let me ask you this. Those other nine, doesn't the story say that they got healed? Does it say that, they're all, that they actually didn't get healed because they didn't come back and actually glorify God? So the people that want to say, well, why isn't your church bigger? Why, you know, if these people are getting saved, then how come you have more people in church? Look, one out of ten came back to actually even give thanks unto God. Just because someone gets saved doesn't mean that they're automatically just going to be in church and they're going to be serving God and they're going to give all oh, God all those thanks and stuff. Should they be doing it? Of course they should. <laughs> I mean, what do you, who do you think you are receiving this great gift and this healing stuff from God and then, and then just ignoring them and not doing anything about it and not at least giving them thanks? But it doesn't change the fact that they were healed. Amen. It doesn't change the fact that they, they received salvation. I mean, this, this is the exact same thing that we're talking about here. And Jesus comments on it. Now, I want to make one more point clear. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 5. It's the last place I'll have you turn. We're seeing the, the symbolism between the, the healing that Jesus Christ physically did and our own and, and salvation, right? But I also, you know, we're, we're also seeing that Jesus does have the power to heal. 
and we see these various elements in the healing process that he was doing. And what I, what I want to just make a brief mention of, just to, to make sure you're aware of this, is that there's false teachers today that'll twist what the Bible is teaching regarding healing and faith to basically browbeat people and even extort people by saying that their faith is lacking if they're not healed. So here, here's what I mean by that. You say, well, what do you mean? It says that you know, their faith has healed them. You know, by, you know, Jesus said that over and over again, and he did. Absolutely. But when there are people who are sick, like today, you know, like I said, Jesus isn't walking around and literally healing people. This was an event, mind you, also, that is extraordinary. Okay? When Jesus was on this earth, there was more healing going on you know, by one person than ever. You can look all throughout the Old Testament. Are there miracles recorded? Yes. But do you know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years were going by before, between, you know, these events that were taking place? We saw Elisha did some great miracles, didn't he? I mean, even to the point of being able to bring someone back from the dead. There, there have been miracles that have been done in the past, but they were few and they were far between. When Jesus came, I mean, this was happening on a regular basis all the time and even continued with the apostles. But we see that one of the main reasons why they had all of this, the, the, these same miracles that Jesus had laid his hands on them and had given them these powers to heal the sick, to cast out devils, and to do all the work that they were doing. I mean, he, he literally w w gave them that power then. And what it did was it confirmed the word. There was a change in the law because there was a change in the priesthood from the, from the Levitical priesthood unto the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. And there was a few changes that went on. So when, when you're introducing some new things in Scripture, God, you know, this is the way it's been for all these years. These miracles were being done to confirm and to prove this is of God. Okay? Now, after that time, we don't see these, you know, the, the same quantity of miracles just happening all the time. Now, it doesn't mean that God's not capable of performing miracles at all. Or he's not capable of healing. Of course, He still is. And it does happen. Absolutely. Amen. There's plenty of testimony of that. But, you, you, you know, we need to watch out for the, the snakes and the charlatans, like the Benny Hens of this world that want to come in and put on a big show. They get on the TV and they put on this big show and they hire actors to pretend like they're sick, to pretend like, they oh, I've been in this wheelchair and stuff. And it's, it's people that nobody knows. But they're putting it on like a circus show to put people out there and say, oh, wow, now all of a sudden I'm healed. And people are falling down and, and you know, left and right and all kinds of weird stuff going on. Don't get sucked into that, especially these days with the, with the power that the, the television has and, and the influence. You know, those people are charlatans. Their healings aren't true. There's been many exposés done on, on those false, phony preachers that are out there, you know, stealing from people. And you know how you could spot, one easy way to spot them is when they're telling you to send in all your money and send, you know, and you just have to have the faith. And if you don't have enough faith, you know, you got to dig deep in your pocket. You get, God's going to bless you. He's going to give you so much more. That's a, a sure sign of a false prophet. Yeah. Just because you know what? They're just after your money. They're going to they're gonna string a little carrot out in front of your nose saying, oh, yeah, you know, God could heal Jesus, Christ, which is true. Jesus can heal. But they're going to they're going to deceive you into thinking that, you know, they have this special power of God and, and we'll sell you this little cloth, this healing prayer cloth that was used by the Apostle Paul. And we were able to reproduce this and mass produce it in our manufacturing age. And now we get it out to you with your small donation of $9.99.99, right? Or whatever it is, whatever, whatever they're trying to sell you on. Or, or it's, only, it's only 10 bucks, but it's only going to last you about 30 days. That blessing kind of wears off. So you got to make sure you got to get a good supply of these things. You know, it, it's, it, it's laughable, but you know what? It's a shame. Yeah. These people are bringing a bad name upon Jesus Christ. Some people get sucked into that, unfortunately, and then it leaves them never wanting to go back to any church because they've been poisoned by these false prophets that are just after their money when they finally realize they've been had. And they lose their faith in the actual healing that Jesus Christ possesses because they've been deceived by a phony. Yeah. 
I want to give you an example of, of this, just, just to help maybe make this clear where you can, you can have both. You could still have the full healing power of Jesus, but with the understanding that there's, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's more to it than just every single thing that you say, God, like, like as if God's a genie, he's just going to do it, right? It has to be, it has to be all within the, the realm of God's word. Um, you know, because what, what a lot of these false preachers will do, they'll just take one or two verses out of context. So in the Bible, it says, you know, ask and you shall receive, right? And that's a great verse. And it's true. But there are limitations on that. It's not, it's not just any single thing you ask for at all, no matter what it is, that God's just going to give it to you. That's not what it means. You see, there, there's, there's many other principles in there. Like, for example, you can't just expect God to answer a prayer in which you ask for no person to ever physically die anymore ever again. You say, God, I'm asking you, so you said ask you shall receive. I don't ever want anybody ever to die physically in this world ever again because I don't like death and that's a bad thing. God's not going to answer that prayer. It's not going to happen. Now, one of the reasons is because, you know, and I don't care how much faith you have. I don't care how much you believe it. You can have all the faith in the world. That's not, that's not going to come true. Why? Because it's not according to God's will. God can't go back on other things. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this a judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and the salvation. It's appointed unto men once to die. That's the way God made it. It's the way it is. God's already said that this is going to happen. You know, sin brought death into the world. You cannot get rid of that. Just by, you know, it, 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 you, God can't make contradictions by answering your prayer. That's just one example, right? I mean, so, you know, but people like, you know, false prophets like to take verses out there and just, and just run with it and, and make you think that God's like a genie. And that if you open up your wallet and give them all this money, then you'll have this power too. We always have to consider the will of God in our prayers and expectations for healing. We don't always know the will of the Lord for the life of, of any person, ourselves included. And that's, you know, the entire full just... The, this is the exact road that God has for you. We know what God's will is. We know that God wants us to serve him. We know that God wants us to preach the gospel. We know that what God wants us to live a righteous life. We know all these various things that God wants us to do, but we don't know exactly how he plans on using us. You know, Stephen in the Bible that was martyred, he didn't know that that was the way that, that God had planned for his life to be, but you know what? He was in the will of God and I guarantee you that was God's will that that happened because there was greater, you know, there's more things and there's a great impact that he had through that happening. Other people lived out, you know, the Apostle John probably lived out his entire life. And that's what he said unto Peter. You know, Peter saying, well, what, you know, what's going to happen to him? Because Jesus prophesied unto Peter saying, you know, when you get older, people are going to take you where you don't want to go. And basically explaining how he's going to be, how he's going to be killed, how he's going to glorify God in his death. And he starts asking about other people. He's saying, you know what? You don't need to worry about other people, Peter. Just worry about yourself. We don't know what God's will is individually for each, each one of us. Peter got a glimpse into it when Jesus told him. Okay? But we don't know that. So we can't just say, well, this prayer wasn't, you know, God, God you know, this, the Bible's not true because God didn't answer this specific prayer or something. We have to allow for, for God's greater wisdom than ours to be able to work and, and to use things to, to bring good in, in, in all situations. But sometimes it's going to happen through a person not necessarily getting healed physically. The, the, the stories are given there, I believe, primarily to show us our, our spiritual healing. But they're also there to show us what Jesus Christ actually did and to show us that the healing is possible. There, there are um, people that can be healed. James chapter 5, though, gives us, in the New Testament, a biblical example of how we should deal with disease and sickness and prayer and healing. And it's very reasonable what we can expect. You know, we don't, we don't always know the will for a person's life, but we do see examples of mercy being given to the humble and the faithful. So this is why we don't just forsake the praying and the asking. Uh, King Hezekiah was someone who was told, hey, he's got a disease and it was going to kill him. He prayed unto God. He humbled his heart. He said, God, you know, please remember all these good things I did for you. God granted him another 15 years. He did it. I mean, that was, that was back in the Old Testament. That was before Jesus' days. 
after Jesus' days, we could see people still receiving healing. It does happen. So we don't forsake the praying or anything like that. But we have to always remember and keep in mind that it may not be any fault of your own if God chooses not to grant heal physical healing unto someone. The Apostle Paul, great example. He said that he, you know, he had a thorn in his flesh. We don't know exactly what it is. You know, some people say it was something with his eyes. doesn't matter what it is. He entreated the Lord three times to help him out with that. He's saying, God, you know, I've got this, problem, this physical ailment, this physical problem. Please help me with this that's going on. And God said, you know what? My grace is sufficient for thee. You have heard you, but this is part of my plan for you. This is, you know, it's going to be all right. And God didn't provide that specific physical healing. But look at how much work the Apostle Paul did for God. Yeah. And, and the rewards that were racked up from heaven. So we, we pray because we entreat our Father. We're asking Him for things to help us out with. And He does answer. But don't let that discourage you if you think that your prayer is going unanswered because we don't see the full picture that God sees. But how do we deal with healing? We have our prayer list. And I, I'm trying to make a point of, of expressing how important it really is to be praying for these people because God does heal and God does cause, can cause a lot of things that happen in people's lives. You're in, in James 5, look at verse number 14. James 5, 14, right near the end of the chapter, right near the end of the book. The Bible reads, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That last verse, verse 16, gives us a lot of insight into how we could have effectual prayer. Prayer that is working. Prayer that's getting through to God, and God's answering. He says, confess your faults one to another. It's going to keep you humble. Pray one for another. So you're praying for other people that you may be healed. We pray for other people. You know, the, the same measure that you meet is going to be measured unto you again. If you're never praying for anybody else, but then all of a sudden you expect someone, you know, someone to answer your prayers, it's kind of like, why should I do that? I mean, you haven't been caring about anyone else. Now all of a sudden you care about yourself. Um, and it says the effectual fervent prayer. So this is, this is real prayer. It's not just chanting. It's not just repeating. If you, okay, God bless this food in my body, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's not a fervent prayer at all. That's a chant. When we're praying, it ought to be from our heart. We ought to be fervently praying to the Lord. And it says, of a righteous man availeth much. A righteous man. First of all, someone that's saved. Obviously, God doesn't hear you if you, if you, don't, if you don't even have belief in him. But once you, once you believe... It's not, I don't think that's just talking about your salvation. I think it's talking about you living a righteous life and doing good things and God seeing, okay, you're listening to me when I've commanded you not to do this, not to do this, not to do this. You're listening to me. I've commanded you to do this. You're listening to me in doing this. And this is where this righteousness comes in. You're listening to God. You're not getting into sin. You're doing what he's told you to do. Okay, since you listen to me, now I'll listen to you. And again, that makes sense. If my kids entreat me and they ask me something, because that's what prayer is. When you pray, you're asking for something. If my kids decide to ask me for something, they, they need something, they want something from me, and they ask it of me. Whatever it is, whatever is in their heart that they say, I want this, I'm having a problem, Dad, can you help me with this? If I've continually been telling them, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, and they, and they refuse to listen to me, how likely am I to really want to, to help them out? You have to say, well, look, why should I be helping you out now when you haven't done anything that I've been asking you to do and telling you to do? And, more, you know, it's, it's a lot less likely to happen. But when they listen and obey and do things, then I'm going to be a lot more likely to bless and answer and give and give even more abundantly. Give even more than they asked for. If they're, if they're just being really great children, you know what? Those things are going to seem like nothing. 
And this is the way that we ought to live our lives, to try to be well-pleasing in the sight of our Heavenly Father. Well-pleasing in the way that we live. If we want our prayers answered, hey, let's be praying for other people. Let's be looking out and caring for other people. Let's be doing what God, listening to God, what He tells us to do. So that way when we need something of Him, we can go to God in prayer and ask Him for His help and have a lot more confidence that, you know what, He's going to hear us. And, and we can receive that healing. God's power is not shortened today. We do need to, and actually in James, the Bible tells us in chapter 1, again, this isn't in my notes either, but now of course I already closed my Bible. Here we go, James chapter 1. Yes, thank you. <laughs> My mind just totally went blank now. I'm like, what am I looking for? James 1, verse number 5. <laughs> if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So another, another aspect of our prayer to God in, in asking, we're asking for healing, we're asking for these things, is that we have the faith. I mean, we fully believe God is capable of doing this stuff. We're not asking Him to do something that we don't ever think is even going to happen. We're asking in faith. We're asking that, God, I know that you're capable of doing this. And if it's your will, Lord, please heal me. Please heal this person. Please, you know, please make this good come out of this situation. Those are the types of prayers, and those are the prayers that, that we're going to see answered. And those, you know, this effectual, fervent prayer is going to avail much. And in James 5, it goes on to tell us about um, how Elijah prayed that there wouldn't be any rain. And then he prayed again that there would be rain after three and a half years of no rain, and God brought it. Showing the, the effectual, fervent prayer that Elijah had, and God listening and saying, Okay, you pray it's not going to rain, it's not going to rain. You're praying now it's going to rain, it's going to rain. Elijah was a righteous man. Don't get caught up into, the, into the, the phony faith healers that want to just steal your money. But also don't forget that God is fully powerful and able to heal today. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much um, for all the great works that you've done throughout history. God, we thank you for these, these encouraging stories that we see of all the healing that's gone on through Jesus Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to, um, to bring sinners to you, dear Lord, to help them to get healed uh, through you, Lord. And, and we pray that you would please heal our infirmities, our physical infirmities, dear God. We have a lot of, a lot of uh, people that are hurting, a lot of people who are ill within our church. Lord, we always have had this. We pray that you would please hear our prayers, help us to, um, to, to be listening to you and doing what you have for us to do, dear God. But, and we also pray that you would um, alleviate some of the, the pain and sickness and the things that are going on, that we can be at full strength and that we can serve you fully, dear Lord. Uh, all things done according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.